Thank you, Scott. Um, so as Scott mentioned, I'm gonna talk a, a little bit more about prevention and treatment of frailty and sarcopenia. Um, hopefully it will be a nice follow-up to the previous talks. So we all heard quite a bit about sarcopenia. I won't, <coughs> won't talk more about sarcopenia specifically or in, in terms of definition, but I did want to just highlight the overlap with this concept of frailty, um, primarily through those physical function components of sarcopenia, the weak muscle strength and physical function impairments. Um, and these together overlap with frailty, which is sort of a, a slightly different concept that reflects increased vulnerability from declines in multiple different aging systems. And for, we haven't actually talked too much about frailty yet at this meeting. Usually we've, everyone's defined it about five times by now, but I'll just briefly mention that frailty um, can often be defined by the freed frailty phenotype or by a deficit accumulation model uh, in addition to about 300 other different definitions that have been used previously. Um, and we know that compared to people without HIV, people with HIV tend to experience both a faster onset and an earlier onset of things such as sarcopenia, um, specifically that loss of muscle mass and muscle quality, um, physical function impairments, and frailty. And so importantly, as it started to come out in the last few sessions, how do we treat and potentially even prevent some of these declines with increasing age, uh, especially in people with HIV? These are the currently approved FDA therapeutics for frailty and sarcopenia. And as you can see, none meet these criteria. Um, part of this has been complicated by the definition of sarcopenia, as was discussed in uh, Dr. Cawthon's talk, is we really have struggled to come up with a way to define sarcopenia. And if you don't have a clear definition of something, it's hard to then say that you have a therapy to treat it. Um, this has also been true for frailty. And as a result, we don't have any approved FDA therapies. Lots of different therapies have been tested as ways to improve both muscle mass or measures of muscle quantity, as well as muscle function. Some of these specifically in people with HIV, um, but more so in the AIDS-wasting cachexia period um, early in HIV, or early in the AIDS crisis, such as growth hormone, um, appetite stimulants such as megesterol acetate, and then certainly testosterone that's been tested quite a bit in HIV. I wanted to highlight a really fantastic supplement that was published in June of 2023 um, in the Journals of Gerontology that looked at um, function promoting therapies and was a summary of an NIA workshop. And this really goes through um, several different therapies and the potential benefit, not at all specific to HIV, but it was just a really nice summary of different therapies that may be in the works for treating sarcopenia and or frailty. Um, I wanted to focus on a couple of different mechanisms and potential treatments that I thought might be particularly relevant to people with HIV. Um, this was a figure I came up upon looking at different mechanisms that might contribute to sarcopenia. And as you can see, um, does that pointer work? I think it's a mouse. The um, aging is certainly a big component that contributes to sarcopenia, the contribution of chronic diseases, which may include HIV, and then certainly a, a major contribu contribution of lifestyle factors, such as a sedentary lifestyle factor, and then as well as obesity. And uh, together, obesity and, um, and chronic diseases and aging may all contribute to things like insulin resistance, inflammation, which we talked a bit about in the discussion, as well as low testosterone. Um, so one potential way that we could treat sarcopenia would be through some sort of agent that targets all of these different mechanisms or hallmarks of aging, which were talked about in a couple of the prior talks. And I wanted to just uh, briefly mention a study that Mary Claire Masters, who's in the room somewhere, I forget where she, in the back there, um, she's leading in the AIDS clinical trials group that's looking at actually a synolytic therapy um, to improve measures of muscle function and muscle um, strength called A5226, and they'll be looking at desatinib and quisertin. So I think this is a study that's up and running and will, or up in process, and will hopefully provide a little bit more uh, information about how kind of targeting the general aging process may impact sarcopenia. Um, obesity and insulin resistance are also an important con contribution to sarcopenia. And this is in contrast to what we may think of as kind of that undernourished anorexic or cachectic type patient that we may think of more classically with sarcopenia. 
And this has led to potentially two different kind of phenotypes of sarcopenia, where we might see a undernourished, under, um, underweight individual with sarcopenia as they age, and then kind of the opposite extreme where we may see an overweight patient with obesity um, that then has a different phenotype and also may result in a different treatment and way that we think about treating sarcopenia. As we heard in some of the prior talks, there's a very close overlap between sarcopenia and obesity. And in addition to what we heard from the first speaker, where those muscle cells or some of those progenitor cells are con um, converting into fat within, uh, within the muscle and in increasing age, we also see that fat just deposits in the muscle, similar to the ways that fat, fat deposits in the visceral adipose tissue, fit, fat deposits in the liver, and fat deposits in pericardial tissues. We see fat that deposits in muscle. Um, uh, Dr. Duque showed some pictures of this on CAT scan. This is just a picture of an actual muscle. Um, it looks a bit like a ribeye steak with nice marbling within the muscle and then some fat around the outside of the muscle. And you can imagine how this might impact someone's ability to function with their muscle. And this fat within the muscle also creates a lot of inflammation. Uh, and as I've mentioned in the discussion, we found that this increased fat within muscle contributes both to poor muscle function and strength in both people with and without HIV, um, likely to a greater extent to, in those with HIV. So when we think about potential ways that we might treat this um, fat, uh, and if we can decrease body weight, could that improve someone's muscle function as well as muscle quality? Um, certainly, we've heard a lot about these new weight loss medications, such as semaglutide or Ozempic or um, Wagovi. Lots of celebrities trying to get these treatments. It's been in the news, and we've had a massive drug shortage of these treatments in the US. Um, so do these medications actually improve muscle function and muscle strength or muscle quantity? Uh, a couple of studies have looked at DEXA, which has its limitations, as we've heard about this morning, um, as a measure of body composition in these weight loss studies. The STEP1 trial was a large trial that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine a couple of years ago, included individuals with an obese BMI greater than 30, as well as people with an overweight BMI that also had comorbidities, and randomized participants to the higher dose of semaglutide, 2.4 milligrams subcutaneous weekly compared to placebo. You can see the very impressive weight changes with a weight loss of over 15 kilograms or 30 pounds um, through the course of the study. But that is also accompanied by relatively large loss of lean mass. What does that mean? Um, is that lean mass actually reflecting a loss of muscle? Or is that shifts in liver fat or shifts in fat in other locations, as was highlighted in the first talk, where we see fat in multiple different tissues, or lean mass um, measured in multiple different ways? Uh, we've seen one study in people with HIV. This was pub or just presented at ID Week a couple of weeks ago by Dr. McComsey and looked at people with HIV that had had antiretroviral as associated weight gain. She used the smaller dose of semaglutide, one milligram subcutaneous weekly versus placebo. Um, similarly saw impressive changes in weight with an 8.3% weight loss and also very impressive decreases in lean mass, both in the placebo arm um, with a small, a small loss in the placebo arm, as well as 5.4% loss in lean mass in the course of this study. Now, both of these studies also noted that the percent of lean mass compared to overall weight actually improved. So because people lost more fat, they actually had a greater proportion of lean mass uh, at completion of the study, but they did have these lean mass losses. So what does this mean? This was a meta-analysis that was present, or published a couple of um, months ago in Diabetic, Medica Diabetic Medicine um, and looked at uh, the studies that have included measures of physical function or measures of muscle function as part of these weight loss studies. Most of them were restricted to self-reported physical function through an SF36 or the um, IWQOL, so different measures of quality of life. Uh, the first two studies did find a significantly greater improvement in physical function in those that received semaglutide compared to placebo. 
Several other studies failed to find significant improvements in function. Um, but you would think as someone lost 30 pounds, they probably would have an improvement in the way that they're able to function just because of less weight to carry around. So I think this is a, an area of much interest as to how, what is happening to muscle function as people are losing weight, particularly as we think of an older adult population, uh, many of whom are receiving these therapies. Only two studies in, that were found for this meta-analysis actually looked at objective measures of function. Um, both of those studies included the older drugs, liraglutide or exenatide, and did not find a significant improvement in VO2 max or six-minute walk time in those studies. So still a lot of information to be gleaned from how these um, weight loss drugs may impact physical function and sarcopenia, and certainly an important topic as our patients get older. Uh, we will be exploring this a little bit further in the slim liver study. This is an AIDS clinical trials group funded study where we're, we randomized, or sorry, we did not randomize, we um, provided semaglutide. Um, we did not have a placebo arm, but just gave semaglutide one milligram subcutaneous weekly to people with HIV and fatty liver disease, as well as evidence of metabolic dysfunction. Uh, participants all received drug for 24 weeks, and then we had an observation period off of drug for 24 weeks, and we're completing those final visits right now. Um, the, our primary outcome is looking at liver fat by MRI proton density fat fraction, but we were able to capture, as Dr. Cawthon mentioned in the discussion, able to capture the MRI measures of muscle volume and muscle density from the MRI that was done of the liver. So we could look at the trunk muscles to see a little bit of what's happening with muscle density and muscle, uh, muscle area in these um, patients as they, or these participants as they receive semaglutide. We also measured physical function, both by time to rise from a chair and gait speed, and these have been submitted um, in abstracts, so stay tuned for some more information on those soon. So this raises the question of what is the ideal intervention if we're seeing patients that have sarcopenic obesity? And this was an older study published um, over 10 years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, but I think really highlights the importance of combination therapy as we're thinking about people aging with both sarcopenia and obesity. This study looked at older adults, 65 or older, who had a BMI of 30 or more, and randomized participants to either diet and exercise, exercise alone, diet alone, or a control arm. As you can see in the two figures on the right, the top figure shows an objective measure of physical function by a physical performance score, and the bottom is a subjective self-reported physical function. And the diet and exercise group had the greatest improvements in physical function, um, followed by the exercise group, followed then by the diet group. So we really had the most improvement when people received both a weight loss intervention plus exercise to maintain muscle function. Both the diet group and the exercise and diet groups lost a similar amount of weight, and only the exercise and diet group combined had a pres greater preservation of their lean mass compared to diet alone. So as people are dieting, they're gonna tend to lose weight, and if we can continue exercise with that, um, we have a better likelihood of, of improving both physical function, muscle function, and um, muscle quantity. Um, which brings me to talk a little bit more about exercise itself and how we might improve physical function and or sarcopenia and frailty through exercise. And so what is the ideal intervention to treat and prevent sarcopenia and frailty? And I want to provide some data as to why I think this should be exercise. Um, so we have looked at uh, exercise recommendations and kind of how we, how we might change exercise recommendations or what specific recommendations should be given for people with HIV through a couple of different studies. Um, the first one is the Exercise for Healthy Aging, or EHAS study, which we conducted from about 2014 to 2017. And in this study, we enrolled people with and without HIV that were aged 50 or older and had everyone come in for supervised, center-based aerobic and resistance exercise. All of our participants um, started at a moderate intensity of exercise for 12 weeks, and then we randomized them to continue at a high or a moderate intensity exercise for an additional 12 weeks. And with this study, we really wanted to ask the question, is high intensity more effective at improving things such as physical function, muscle outcomes, or does it potentially exacerbate inflammation, lead to greater dropout, lead to more side effects? Of note, we did not have a dietary intervention here. It would have been great, but it was on a K award, and those of you that have kept K awards know that there's no budget with these, so that was not possible. Um, so 
as Dr. Cawthon mentioned, we actually separated out a lot of our components of sarcopenia rather than comparing kind of an overall general sarcopenia characteristic. So I'm going to present some of our study or some of our findings that really emphasize why I think exercise is an ideal um, treatment for physical function and components of sarcopenia. So first we looked at some changes in muscle function, um, both by change in short physical performance battery, and I showed differences here just in people with HIV. You can see at baseline in the figure on the far left that those with HIV started with about 40% that had some sort of impairment in short physical performance battery. And these impairments decreased with time with almost all blue um, by the end of the study period. We also looked at changes in chair stand time, 400 meter walk time, and that measure of exercise endurance or exercise capacity by a VO2 maximum. The red bars show people with HIV and the black bars show people without HIV. The first kind of darker color of the bar shows the first 12 weeks and then the lighter uh, sh shading shows the second 12 weeks. Um, so you can see the overall improvement in physical function measures ranged anywhere from about 10% to 30%. So nice improvements in both our people with HIV and with without HIV. And we actually tended to see a little bit greater percent improvement in those with HIV with exercise. Uh, there was a comment or a question earlier about do people have the same uh, capacity to, to respond to exercise interventions? And this is suggested that at least people with HIV have a um, similar capacity to respond to the intervention. We didn't see very impressive differences by exercise intensity in these function markers. And so overall, we saw that people with HIV tended to have greater percent improvements with physical function and similar changes with, uh, regardless of intensity. We then looked at some specific measures of muscle strength. So we looked at grip strength, um, bench press, a leg press, and then a lateral pull down. So using expensive weight machines. Um, and we were able to see very nice improvements um, anywhere between about 10% to 40% in some of our improvements in muscle mass, or sorry, in muscle strength, um, and actually tended to be a little bit higher in those with HIV, um, depending on the test. And then when we looked at the, the impact of high intensity in the blue bar or red intensity in the um, reddish, or sorry, red intensity, moderate intensity in the red bar, we saw that uh, almost everyone had greater improvements if they were randomized to the high intensity arm, really emphasizing the importance of high intensity exercise to improve muscle strength in people with HIV. Um, Although we have DEXA, um, which has its imperfections, I, I did want to highlight that we actually did see improvements in lean mass despite losses in fat mass, which oftentimes when someone is losing weight, we saw an overall loss in BMI, a decrease in fat mass, but we're able to increase lean mass with our exercise intervention and strength exercise. And then just to highlight a couple of pathways as we, that, that may be um, places to intervene, as we know that sometimes, uh, as we mentioned in some of the earlier talks, people can't come into exercise sessions, they get ill, they get hospitalized, um, they have muscle aches and pains and can't exercise to the intensity that we liked. I just wanted to highlight a couple of potential pathways where we could um, develop therapeutics or think that we might intervene to also improve muscle function. Um, we tended to see a greater decrease in high sensitivity CRP in our people with HIV that exercise to a higher intensity, really, really emphasizing the potential benefit of a higher intensity exercise. And then in the middle section of these inflammatory markers, we saw a much higher increase in IL-10 in our people with HIV or without HIV, which is an anti-inflammatory cytokine, suggesting that maybe there's something in the inflammatory pathway that people with HIV aren't having that same beneficial anti-inflammatory uh, effect of exercise. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of the inflammation markers and their potential impact in Dr. Ditzenberger's abstract in a few minutes. Um, we also saw changes in mitochondrial function, and uh, Dr. Sung presented a little bit of this, or mentioned a little bit of this in her presentation, but we saw that citrate synthase um, failed to increase in people with HIV. Manganese sulfate uh, had a blunted improvement, as did PGC1-alpha, within the skeletal muscle in people with HIV. Um, potentially highlighting that we need to, uh, additional interventions or some other way to overcome some of these mitochondrial responses um, and reasons that people may not respond as well to exercise uh, with HIV or with functional impairments. And then 
Lastly, um, we talked a bit about uh, muscle epige or about epigenetic patterns in Dr. Sun's talk. We looked at skeletal muscle methylation patterns and found that there were um, fewer differentially methylated CPG sites um, after exercise intervention. So muscle tended to look much different in people with HIV and without HIV at baseline, and the muscle looked more similar after exercise. We also looked at an epigenetic age clock called the MEAT clock, which has been used uh, just with skeletal muscle. It has not been uh, used in very many studies, but we uh, unfortunately didn't really see any differences with this, but it was one of the first times that it had been used in HIV. So it was, I think it has um, uh, some potential for future studies, but we failed to see any improvement in this in our small sample. Um, several other studies have certainly shown improvements in components of sarcopenia in people with HIV. I won't go through these in detail, but I think there's definitely literature supporting the importance of exercise. Um, but as we know, sedentary rates are high in people with HIV. Many stop exercising after studies are completed or never start exercising. And we really need ways to maximize responses and increase physical activity across the lifespan, not just in older people once they've developed sarcopenia. Um, and so the health study, which Dr. Sung mentioned, we are exploring the impact of high intensity exercise, high intensity interval training to see if we can potentially improve adherence, maximize some of the responses that we saw in our earlier studies. And we've added in a supportive text messaging and some ways to hopefully improve long-term adherence uh, in this study. We're also collecting many different outcomes, which I think will hopefully give us more insights into what's happening with the muscle with exercise, including skeletal muscle fat by MRI, MR spectroscopy to look at changes in in vivo mitochondrial measures, um, PBMC and muscle mitochondrial function and mitochondrial DNA, um, led by Dr. Sung. And then we're including muscle ultrasound as a bedside measure to kind of test this as a possibility for looking at muscle and people with HIV as a low cost portable intervention. And uh, Dr. Ditzenberger shared a couple images from this study that she's leading. The first figure on the top showing pre-exercise and the bottom figure showing post-exercise. And you can see a nice increase in the thickness of muscle with exercise just on this kind of cheap bedside measure of ultrasound. So potentially an exciting tool for looking at muscle. Um, and importantly, I think we really need to think about when we're intervening and how can we prevent some of these changes in sarcopenia that we're seeing, uh, beginning even with these muscle losses that we see in, the t in age 20 or age 30. Uh, and I came across this study that I'm really curious to see outcomes of in a few years, but this is a study being proposed in Brazil of people initiating antiretroviral therapy, and they're actually having participants come to group therapies and exercise sessions at the time that they start antiretroviral therapy. And I think this is an important place to think is how can we start talking <clears throat> about physical therapy much earlier in the process rather than waiting until people have functional impairments. Um, and we have been uh, somewhat interested in this, I, how can we improve exercise recommendations? Um, I worked with Dr. Moore and some of the, um, uh, the scholars at UCSD to come up with an exercise prescription several years ago. This is available in AIDS as a PDF if anyone's interested. I think I'm probably the only one that uses it to prescribe exercise, but it is available if anyone's interested, and I'm curious to see if this actually could help to improve exercise recommendations in the general population. So in summary, people with HIV appear to be at greater risk for sarcopenia and frailty than people without HIV. Exercise remains the treatment of choice for sarcopenia and frailty, although other therapies may offer benefit, and interventions to optimize exercise recommendations and improve long-term adherence are needed. I just wanted to acknowledge our study participants. This is one of our participants who's been featured in our UC Health uh, newsletter and has volunteered for both of my studies and is still exercising and has lost 40 pounds, so he's very exciting. Um, the team, our study teams for health and for uh, healthy exercise for healthy aging, National Institutes of Health for their funding, and thank you for all being here, and I'm happy to take any questions.